Hi there, um, I'm Sarah Jane Gibbon and in this presentation we're going to have a look at the place names that relate to Scale and Broch in Westside in Rousey. I'm also going to have a little bit of a look at some of the historic and genealogical records just so that we can get a feel for um, what these places mean and who was living here in the historic period. So a little bit of a glance into the later history of Scale. I've been looking at place names for a good while now and the more time I spend looking at them, the more confused I get. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing because individuals make names. And although we always like to compartmentalise things and group things, um, it doesn't always work like that. Although thankfully we do have some pointers that can help us understand the names that uh, we're faced with um, in Orkney. The first thing that I always do when I'm looking at a place name is to consult the work of Hugh Marwick. Um, he's really the starting point for anybody and we're very, very lucky in Rousey because he came from Rousey and so he had a vested interest in the island and also a very good knowledge of the place names. So Rousey place names is an ideal place to begin. Other scholars too that you need to think about are Ernest Marwick and Willie Thompson. They've both worked on place names subsequent to Hugh and have made amendments to some of the arguments that Hugh put in place and certainly Willie Thompson's reorganisation of Hugh Marwick's work is really important and you, you should really look at that after having looked at Hugh Marwick. For the course of today I've also looked at some archival sources. Most of these are the open access sources for instance, census returns, valuation rolls, birth, death and marriage records and graveyard surveys. But um, they're all really useful because they help to build up a picture of life in a place. I was then also very lucky to be able to get access to Nigel Firth's exceptional archive collection. And it was um, gifted to the Orkney Library and Archive. I didn't get an opportunity to spend too long looking at it, um, so I've really only touched the surface. But there's a wealth of information there, all very methodically and meticulously recorded and beautifully presented. So hopefully in the future sometime that might be a source to consult further. So the first written reference that we have to the area in which Broch and Scale are situated comes from the Orkney Inga Saga. There are at least nine mentions of Westness in Orkney and Gasaga, and two of these relate to Earl Paul feasting at Westness. This indicates that at least some of Westness belonged to the Earl as he was being entertained on his estate. And the way we know that is because there's a particular term called value, which is used in the saga text. So part of this Westness estate is Earldom land. And in addition, later rental records show that Westness paid no tax, a particular tax called scat, and that nobody expected it to pay scat. And this again shows that part of Westness was Earldom land because the Earldom land did not have to pay that tax. All the other land did. And here are the references in front of you. So we've got Herr Bjorg was the name of Paul's third daughter. She was the mother of Ingeborg the Highborn, who was married to Sigurd of Westness, Sigurdur of Westnessy, and their sons were Hakan Peak and Brynjolf. So that's part of the genealogy within the Orkney Inga saga, and we can see immediately that Sigurd of Westness has high status connections to the earldom. Earl Paul Hackinson's best friends were Sigurd of Westness and Thorkel Sumaldilisson. So again, here we're getting an indication that Sigurd of Westness is not only related to the earldom, but he's also kin or friends with the earls. And in Norse society, friendships are incredibly important um, and particularly significant in terms of the power structure of Norse society. In about the 1130s, we know that there lived at Westness in Rousey a man of rank named Sigurd. So again, this is when they're laying out who the big, best, powerful people are in the saga and Sigurd of Westness features there. And it's no surprise that Sigurd is given a task within the earldom. He's in charge of mustering troops for the Rousey area. So again, you can see that he has quite a powerful role within the earldom. And then this last phrase I've put in the Old Norse for you, 
and it just has that term value, that feasting term um, that indicates that there was earldom land here and that that relationship, that feasting relationship was taking place at Westness. What we don't get from the saga is a description of where Sigurd and Paul and their men were feasting. Was it near the present day farm of Westness or was it near to scale and the work? We don't know. Marwick, Hugh Marwick, thought scale and broch were at the centre of the lands of Sigurd and that Sigurd's hall was near scale. Although there are various possible sites for the hall, so we have Westness, Swandro, Broch, Scale, the work, none of these have been dated so we just really don't know. From analysis of later records it seems very likely that as um, Willie Thompson tells us in Sigurd's day his lands or his Westness lands comprised the earldom lands of Inner Westness and probably all of Quandle, along with his Uda lands of Scale and Broch. Um, so this is a similar unit to Trail's 19th century Westness estate. But before we leave that, I just want to mention the word Udal. This is a term that's used in Orkney and it's quite a loaded term, has lots of different meanings, but really what it means here is just it was private land. So Sigurd's estate was made up of land that he had been gifted by the Earl and also land that he owned in his own right. And that's what we're seeing the differentiation between them. So Earldom land belonging to the Earl, Udal land, privately owned land. So from the sagas alone, we get the impression and the understanding that Westness was an important place and there were important people living there and even more important people visiting there. We're really lucky that some of the exploits in the sagas are recorded as having taken place there. And perhaps the most um, important or significant um, incident that happens is when Earl Paul is kidnapped by Svein Asleferson when he is hunting um, for otters um, at Westness. So we get a real sense there of that kind of um, medieval Earl feasting, hunting, and then being kidnapped. And, and after that incident, he never reappears. And we don't know really what happened to Errol Paul, but presume that it wasn't very good. We get that from the saga. Another indication that this is a high status place is from the fact that the parish kirk is very nearby. So we have St Mary's parish kirk next to scale. And we also have the work which is another enigmatic building. Um, the meaning of the word work um, just means a, a sort of a fortification. And it, there's also a name of it called the Castle of Westness. So we get this sense of a kind of big, powerful structure here, um, of which you can see the remains in the front, in the foreground here, and also then the, the church. And across Orkney, what we tend to find is where there is earldom land, there is often a parish church. And that's the case here. But what we're not sure about is where that earldom property was that accompanied the church. And that's one of the things we're trying to find out. As well as the parish kirk itself, which we know from church records was dedicated to St Mary, there's a St Mary's well nearby. And then as I've said, the work. And also there's a tunnel under the dike at the work and this is known as the priestess hole so again that connection between fortification and church it's unclear what the building of the work was and that's one of the things that we're looking currently looking into investigating and again we don't know the date that the church was first there if we use information from other parts of Orkney we could reasonably suppose that there was some form of chapel here in the 12th century we would expect to see that close to a scally an earldom property and that that chapel would have been upgraded made larger into a parish church sometime between the 12th and 14th centuries would be quite expected given what we know from other places but in the case here we've not done investigations enough to be able to know the earliest date of that church for obvious reasons we would have to dig in a graveyard and take down the existing building and that's not something we would like to do and so to scale the name in Old Norse is Scali, as I've already mentioned, and in Orkney, this indicates a high status property. There are usually at least one scale in every parish in Orkney, if not more. 
Sometimes you get one in each kind of tone chip. It can be uncompounded, as in this case, so just plain scale, or it can be combined with a second element, as a Lang scale in Wester or Sava scale in Wester. The compound form is often taken to indicate a single property, a single scale that was later divided, but it can also be seen as a means of distinguishing one building from another. So Lang scale would be the long building, the long shed, as opposed to Sava scale, which is the shed or the building near the sea. So if you have two buildings, that's how you tell one from the other. Skali means in Norwegian, it often refers to a shed or a hut or a sort of temporary structure. It doesn't have the same high status meaning. And we don't know quite when or how this translation from something quite small to actually quite a high status building comes. But in Orkney, um, Willie Thompson has done a lot of work on scales and there's an excellent paper that he's written on that. And he very convincingly talks about scale as being a building with a particular function. So it's um, it doesn't have a, a high rental value particularly, but what it seems to have performed is a public function, the feasting function, the big building where people met to come together socially, politically. So that's why it's such a significant building. And in the west side, we know it's located very near to the parish church. There's the gyo of scale, below scale. So again, just reinforcing that that name exists in that landscape and hasn't transferred. The first um, written reference that we get to scale, other um, than indications, you know, um, from the saga, but the first word scale coming in a written record is from 1560 when Magnus Hulkrow obtains a 19 year lease of the bishopric lands in Rousey and included in that is the five penny lands of scale. We don't know when scale became bishopric land. There's no record to tell us that, no charter, but it could have been quite early, perhaps at the same or similar time as to when Egglesey and Sauron were gifted to the church. So we're talking about um, Norse period. We're talking about the time of the Earls. Scale remains in the Hulkrow family um, until it's bought in the 17th century by the Trails. So there's a, a long-standing connection with a single family here. As I've said, we think it was part of Sigurd's Udal or his private lands. So not the earldom part, but this was his own lands. And when we're looking in the records for tenancies, the, the first tenant that we get on record is from 1578. And that's quite early, really, um, for a lot of places. And it was a man no, named John Mode, and he was living in scale. Now, this is not who owned it. This is who was living in it. In the 17th century, um, Craigies were living in scale, Magnus Elder and Younger and Hugh. And in 1693, Magnus Craigie and his wife Jean Trail lived in scale with their four servants. So you're getting an indication here by the surnames that these are still reasonably important people, Craigies and Trails, these are high standing people in Orkney. Um, and then you've got four servants. So again, indicating that this house could support for servants. When we move into the 18th century, there seems to be two households living at scale. So here we go. This is a list of the inhabitants of scale taken from various records in the 18th and 19th centuries. And really, it's just here to show you the, the mix of names and the fact that there's lots of people moving around here. It's not all one family, the people are coming and going. I won't read through all the names, but you can see here um, who they are. And of course, the last in inhabitant was Barbara Smith. Um, and she was out of scale before 1891. So somewhere in that 10 year period, she leaves she leaves the property. Scales land was incorporated into Westness in 1860. And that was after William Corsi's lease expired in 1855. And then it becomes just part of um, the Westness estate. William Corsi was a joiner and he had apprentices. So when we're working at scale, we might expect to find evidence of joinery work um, if we're in a building that he might have been using. Moving now on to Broch. Broch, um, another Old Norse name, this time meaning fortification. 
um, from Odenors Borg, and as we know, it, it often indicates an Iron Age site. Historically, um, we get our first reference to Broch in 1503, and we're really lucky again with these records because Broch is a significant place, and so we have history relating to it. John Craigie of Broch is one of the most important people in Orkney at the time, and his family is incredibly important. Um, and because of his connection with Broch, he appears in many records. The house itself is located on top of South Howe and between the church and Mid Howe. So you can see again, it's in this area of high status settlement. It's thought like scale to have been part of Sigurd of Westness's private property. So he had both scale and Broch. But as I say, it's, we know it through history as the homestead of the Craigies of Broch. They were one of the most influential families in Orkney in the 15th and 16th centuries. And although our first record to the Craigies in Broch is 1503, we have other records that place the Craigies um, and associate them with Rousey earlier than that. So we can suppose that even as early as 1415, we, we have Craigies somehow related to Rousey and possibly Broch, but there's just not enough evidence to say it for sure. But they're certainly in Orkney at the time, and given that this is the place that they take their name from, it's very likely they had a connection with this place from early on. The first people that we find living in Broch um, is from 1564, and that's William Halcrow of Akers and his wife Margaret Craigie. Now, it's quite important to make this distinction. When somebody takes their name of Broch, it doesn't mean they're actually living there, it just means that they take their name from the estate. So this can become confusing, but you should never assume just because it says they're of Broch that they're in Broch. Um, it means they own Broch, um, but they might have tenants living in it, and that's the case here. So we have people owning it and people residing in it. And what you can see in this slide is a list of the people who lived in Broch, because I thought that was probably more interesting for us to know the people um, and the families that actually lived in here. This is another slide just showing us more of the people who lived in Broch um, in the 19th century. Before I leave the earlier history, I also want to mention a transfer in land because we have the Craigies in Broch and then we have the Hulkros coming into Broch. And that comes about because of um, marriage connections between the Craigies and the Hulkros. So it's not a complete shift of familial connection, but in fact, it's to do with a, a daughter marrying a Hulkro and then the land um, transferring over to the Hulkros. So that's really when you find that Hulkro connection coming in, it's due to a marriage with a, a Craigie. So the Craigie connection is still there too. You can see along here that we have that Craigie's continuing to have a presence within the house actually living there and right up to the end then you can see that the houses were occupied up until um, the 1890s and that by 1901 they were officially um, no longer inhabited. A little anecdote um, from Nigel's collection is that boats used to pull into the shore at Brock to collect water from the well of St Mary near the old Mary Kirk and and also we know that Magnus Craigie from Broch West Side um, moved to Broch Frotet. So again this is another thing that in Rousey happens quite often that we need to be careful of when we're looking into the history and that is that as people moved they sometimes take their house names with them and particularly when people were moved from the Westness estate um, for instance they took their house name from Quandal area over to their new residence so you have to be wary of that when you're um, looking at the records just make sure you know which is the right location for that name. I want to finish up um, no, just with a slide to show you some of the other farm names in Westness. And this is really just gathered from maps and some of the place name information that Hugh Marwick gave and also some of Nigel Firth's records. 
without going into them in lots of detail, you can see here the names and I've given where I can what they probably mean. And you'll notice there's some question marks and some gaps and that's quite normal. And maybe you'll be able to help with this. You might know some local stories or information that explains what some of these names mean and why they've been given. But the first thing that's quite striking about these names is that none of them have um, a sort of farm indicator. No Garths or Bisters or Seaters. These sorts of names that would help or would inform us that this is part of a farm or this was a farm doing this or that. Um, there's quite a few Kwai names here. And what that's telling us is these are pieces of land enclosures that have then become settlements over time. And both of these things, so the lack of names of other farms and these Kwai names, pull together to support the notion that Westness, Scale and Broch were the main settlements in that area. There weren't any others. There didn't need to be. You have got Scale, Broch, Westness, and that's really plenty. What these names suggest is that these are maybe later intakes. So as the population increases and people need to find somewhere to live, they move into these areas. And also that these are elements um, within the estate. So they don't have names to indicate that they're individual farms, but they're more to do with descriptive names as to what they are as part of a larger um, estate. I'm not going to go any further today. I think hopefully that's been a useful introduction to you just to the place names and some of the people that have lived at Scale and Broch over the years. Maybe sometime again, we'll go into some more detail about these place names and have a bit of a more in-depth look at the medieval history and those craigies and those hawk roads. So thank you very much for listening to this um, presentation. I've just written here some of the key sources consulted just to give you an idea where you can look to find most of this information. Um, but if you're interested to know more specifics, please, of course, get in touch with me and you can do that through my UHI email address. Um, and thank you very much.